slot keeps on being revealed and we are honored and humbled to welcome here in studio uh, Mr. David Tahar, uh, the father of fallen soldier, a dear Tahar. Uh, David, we're first so, so sorry for your loss and we are grateful um, for you coming here tonight. Um, I will ask you first to tell us about, about Adir, about his heroic fight on October 7th. First of all, hello. Adir on October 7th, uh, Saturday, was in the army base. Friday night he was on duty until 1 o'clock in the morning. And he actually remained guarding with the soldier who replaced him until 3 in the morning. He remained with him. And later on he went to his room and he spoke to his uh, uh, commander till... Late in the morning, a young soldier, 4.30 he went to sleep, 5.45, he was woken up while alerts of missiles and of penetration of terrorists. His officer woke him up, and actually they took all the soldiers who were there at the time, they concentrated them at a certain point in order to explain to them that they're supposed to use all their equipment and to come to a certain other point and to go to some sort of defense on yeah. the base and also attack. And, and, and then, obviously, the fight began. Um, how, when did you get the heartbreaking news of, of him losing his life in battle? Uh, I came back from synagogue on, on Saturday and I realized there's like half world war going on and I uh, sent a WhatsApp uh, message to Adir and I said to him, Adir, I hear a lot of things, just let me know that you're alive, that you're okay and I see that he received the WhatsApp but he didn't read it and a few minutes later I called him and then I put on the television and I I realized the terror that was uh, happening over there in that region. Uh, and then the WhatsApps began of all the soldiers and all the parents. It started becoming like a wave. Everybody's asking and pressure. And I asked a lot of questions. And actually, I realized that no one could communicate with the kids. So we started uh, calling whoever we could to try maybe to even locate the phone to find out where his phone is. Because his phone sometimes um, called and something didn't. So until Sunday, actually, morning, I had no contact with Adir and nobody could give me any answers. However, they gave me a phone number of a hospital to call and every half an hour to ask, to find out whether Adir or his body, if he arrived. And that's actually what I did until Sunday around 7 in the morning. I didn't go to sleep. And on Sunday, I was told to go and to yeah. report him as missing. And uh, in the police uh, headquarters, and I submitted uh, the report of missing. And I asked the policeman, My son is a soldier, why do I have to submit? Uh, what? The army is supposed to know where he is. And I can tell you that the army was in shock, just in shock. And after I submitted the report, I decided on my own will to go back, to go to the hospital. for his son. And I went to the hospital, Barzilai. I can tell you that going from Tel Aviv to the hospital shouldn't take more than 40 minutes. It took me three and a half hours. Because the whole time we were stopped and detained. 
And you see, it was like a movie, like a video game. All sorts of soldiers coming out, and they shoot on cars, and you can see that they're killing people. I got to the hospital, and I started looking around and asking. I went to the ER, I said, did you see a soldier? This is the name. Golani trooper, nobody gave any answers. I even looked at pictures of people who came in a situation that couldn't be identified. I went through them as well, and it wasn't him. He wasn't there. And then I was referred to the military ER, sort of. And I went over there. And I see one of the soldiers who was with Adir that day, apparently, on that day, and I asked him. I said, you serve with Adir? He says, yes. Okay, did you see him? Do you know if he's alive or dead? And apparently it was difficult for him, so he couldn't really utter it. But he said, look, I don't know, but I do know that he fought and he's a hero. Wow. Later on, he was taken by officers to interrogate that soldier so that I will not ask him too many questions. And after three or four hours of interrogation, they took him out. So I asked him again. It was important for me to ask and to understand that he mm-hmm. not abducted my son. My greatest fear was that they abducted Adir, my son. From his answers, I understood that Adir is no longer alive. But after one hour, after he left, these officers came out and they asked me to go into the room. And there they told me that my son and has fallen. for many fallen. people or parents, this is where the story ends. Uh, but for you, it's only the beginning because you kept on looking for answers. I continued to look for answers because I didn't get them. From the army. I cannot tell you if it's because of chaos or they didn't know the answers or they didn't want to cause pain. At the moment, I prefer to say it this way, but I can tell you that at a certain point, I stopped believing them. And I just uh, investigated. by myself. When I asked, after I was told that he fell, I wanted to see the body. I said, okay, if he's dead, where is his body? And they said to me, in a place called Shura, in a place where they collected all the dead people. It sounded logical to me to go there, and they said, no, you cannot get in. I said, if I have to get in with my car, I'm going to get in. And finally, I realized that I'm not going to be allowed to get in, and they couldn't give me an answer. My children were still at home. They wanted to know, and I realized that the boy has fallen. So I went from the hospital to Jerusalem to update my children and Adir's mother. And then the army officers came to sit with me to plan the funeral, and we're talking about Sunday. And they, they, they set the funeral for Monday at 4 p.m. And I said, all right, where is the body? They talked to me about the funeral, but where's the body? I must see the body. I, I will not bury him without seeing him. And then they said, the body will get to the burial place on Herzl Mount. And I realized here that they lied to me. And on Monday, I waited in the morning. Nobody's talking to me, and I called them. They answered me at noon, and the funeral was supposed to take place at four, and I realized that there'll be no funeral. And so at 12.30, they said, look, things are missing. We still haven't got the confirmation. We have to postpone. the funeral, and at that time there was a funeral of another soldier, so I went to the other ones. 
ושם אני רואה מפקדים. And there I saw commanders of the army, and I went to them and said, guys, what's happening with my son? Nobody says. ושם בעצם הם נותנים לי... And there actually they gave me a woman, an officer who really helped me, and she connected me with a commander in that place, Shura, where all the bodies were collected, and I asked him to know if he could see my son. Not only did he see my son, I need a proof. for my son, because I don't believe anybody anymore. And I can tell you that from some Monday, after that funeral, until Tuesday morning, I was still awake from Saturday. And I was on the phone with that commander, and on Tuesday morning, He sent me a message that he found the body, and I asked for proof. So he sent me a junior, his disc dog tag, and he realized I want to see the body, and it was very difficult for him. because he understood that I'm going to see a body with no head. So I asked him questions. I said to him, what's the problem for me to see the body? And he said, look, you should better remember him the way he was. And I insisted, and I did not give up. And I said, look, in any case, I have to see my boy. He is not going to be buried until I see him. I have to touch him. Unfortunately, and fortunately, that's me. That's the kind of father I am. Proud of it. And I am proud. Rightfully so. And then after already this, this devastating story you're telling us, then, then Adil was killed again to an extent with the information you got on, on what happened, on the remains. I can say that actually Adir fought that Shabbat with great courage together with his comrades. They killed quite a few terrorists, barbarous, these are the words, barbaric terrorists. And in order for them to kill Adir, because he was a sniper, and he killed a lot of them, in order for them to continue to control what they could, they threw three grenades at Adir and also a rocket, a missile. And only this way they managed to kill him. But they killed Adir when he was old. When he fell down, they could get hold of that area where he was. And actually, they saw a killed soldier on the ground. And out of, I don't know, some sort of hatred or barbarism, They just shot Adir under his shoulders, and they detached his head from his body. And I want you to understand what they did. They took his head, and they put it in a bag, and they took it to sell it. in Gaza, because they were promised, according to uh, investigations that we had from all these terrorists, they were promised to get $10,000 for every soldier and house. So that terrorist who took Adir's head wanted to make some money. And he put, put it in a bag, he went into Gaza with it, threw the bag into a fridge in the center of Gaza in an ice cream shop. He put a bag, it's a bag, uh, you know, like a handbag, like a, yeah. then when you go to the gym, he put a tennis ball in it and a few documents, and the head of a Jewish soldier. If this is not barbarous, I have no idea what is. No, no, the, the, the gut is turning. I, I, I'm, I'm the one who's sorry, you know, just 
we keep on hearing those horror stories and it hits you every time anew. It's, and, and, and thankfully our body is, is physically rejecting it. We, we cannot get used to it. And going through everything you went through, a dedicated uh, father who literally will do everything and anything for his son, you decided to, to speak up. It's very important for us to talk about it. It's important that the world understands. Very important this point. That there are, you know, people, there are some opinions that say civilians, innocents in Gaza. And I must say it. I didn't find one civilian innocent in Gaza. And the most realistic proof is not from things that I say, but the people of Israel. You can see what happened on October 7th. These barbaric terrorists came in with GoPro cameras documenting at that very moment, live, what they're doing. And there we saw elderly people, handicapped, who came to rape and to kill and to murder children and babies and women, and came to loot and to take and to steal. So who is exactly innocent? What, the elderly person who walked in with budgets? Who is innocent? Those small children who abducted small children? What innocence are we talking about? I can tell you that the soldiers, and among them my son, the hero, fought so that I and you will be able to walk around the streets here without them. I think that you and me as well, they would just murder us with great love. And another thing that's really so painful, who did they murder in these uh, kibbutzim that were so close to the tents? Those people who used to yell at us, the state of Israel, help them, give them. These are the people they murdered. Not that it's better, but it's not. God forbid it shouldn't be. Uh, any Jew, whoever it is, you cannot murder him. But you must realize and understand they do not differentiate between right and left, religious or secular. They want to murder all the Jews. And that's exactly our problem. And I wouldn't dare to say that um, um, this will be part of the legacy or the memory of your hero of a son or his fellow hero soldiers, but hopefully we will not forget so quickly exactly what you said, that uh, we are all united, we're all one, um, and all the differences um, simply do not matter uh, when we're facing the enemy. Mr. De Vital, thank you very much um, for joining us here in studio and sharing uh, your son's story and your story. A brave father of a brave son. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh